Welcome to Five Shirt Weekly. The result of the Toronto match had us regretfully singing Mariah Carey's Heartbreaker. But what did we see from having both DPs on the pitch finally? We discuss all that and more coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Shirt Fam. I'm AJ and this is Chris. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. Follow our Twitch for watch alongs on match days on twitch.tv slash ATLUTD fan TV. So let's get into the 1 0 loss against Toronto on Sunday. It was pretty toe to toe. And unfortunately, yeah, you know, just a, a heartbreaker. Like I said at the top of the show, it uh, definitely had me singing Mariah Carey. And uh, I mean, if anyone knows that song, it's definitely, man, I, I do not want to have that song uh, as beautiful as her voice is in my head for about two plus days. So it's pretty much, yeah, um, you know, Toronto. Uh, kind of nick it at the end through their DP, Pablo Piatti. But before that, I mean, Jurgen Dom was uh, pretty much kind of dominating proceedings a little bit. And, uh, you know, was able to be kind of the all-action guy on the right wing. But, unfortunately, we couldn't find that end product when he was fashioning some of our chances. And then second half, we're finally able to bring in Ezekiel Barco after so many games that he's been out. He's been out since September 12th. And then Marcelino Moreno as well after uh, one game absence. Uh, both of them being on the on at the same time. Two DPs on the pitch. What is happening? Since August 29th, we haven't had that. I mean, it's nuts. But... Yeah, as we found out at the end of the day, still not enough end product as, yeah, there's probably a little bit of time that uh, is needed for the players to bed in. But, yeah, like I said, Piatti kind of uh, just ruins the night for us, I feel like. But uh, what, what was your takeaway in terms of, uh, you know, from the match? And I think you're, when you, when you talk about uh, Dom's influence. I think in the first half, you know, his his play deserved an assist or something. Um, you know, he was causing all kinds of havoc down that right hand side and just getting the better of every single one on one that he had. And and you know, every time he looked up, you know, just I'm just watching the screen. Every time he looked up, there's really nobody within like you know like five yards of the of the box most of the time you know i mean it was you know uh it was, it was gallagher was probably the closest one to him um but it always seemed like it was on a counter and he was isolated and i think that's and I, kind of one of the things that really hurt us um in the game this you know against toronto was that you know there was there was not enough connectivity between the the midfields and the wingers specifically and the attacking front um and you saw that more when barco and moreno came on and they're just looking for runners anywhere um and when don got subbed off all of that all of those all of those forward um all those forward passes just started you know dripping off into the sideways passes that we've kind of grown accustomed to see i think in 2020 so mm -hmm. that was really disappointing and you know the the piatti goal just i don't want to say it came out of nowhere because it was you know, for, for as little clear-cut chances as there were, there was enough back and forth to where I think either team could have appreciated a win. Um, but, you know, that, you know, that uh, you know, Lorea's cross was, again, it was it was well marked by Bello. And I think that, you know, Piatti just got an inch in front of Robinson and, and that was it. it. That's all it needed. So when you have DPs, you know, on the field, sometimes they can just find goals out of nothing. And that's that's kind of what we've been missing for the better half of almost two months at this point. So, Definitely. And uh, I think what's kind of a bitter pill to swallow here is that while we played a lot better uh, in our draw or than in our draw versus Inter-Miami where we were able to rescue a point, uh, that was definitely uh, in the first half against Inter-Miami one of the worst halves that I've ever seen us play. And uh, conversely, Versus Toronto, we you know play some of our probably best ball against the top side in the East, and yet you know it's uh, 
just something that's just flipped completely upside down. But it, you know, I think kudos to them as well because Toronto were able to, I think, uh, you know, be that top side, able to pull out the three points when they need it. Uh, shows, I think, the difference between the two sides, unfortunately, is that, yeah, you know, that, that little bit of, um, you know, I would say maybe uh, it's not lackluster. Yeah, I think you're right. It's like just, you know, a little unlucky maybe on the, the marking uh, from Robinson and, you know, they find the winner. And uh, 89th winner always sings a little bit more, especially when, in, you know, we're level. But, uh, you know, I think in terms of, you know, let's talk about, you know, Barco and Moreno's performances. Like what, what, um, you know, what did you see from them? Like, did you see something uh, that we can build on? I think so. I think both of them play with pace. And that's something that, you know, we uh, get, haven't gotten quite accustomed to uh, for most of the year. But, you know, when Barco came on, he was looking to connect people. Um, whether it was uh, Bello, whether it was, um, uh, you know, Moreno or, or Rometty, he was looking to, you know, to make something happen. And, you know, generally, you know, he was he was kind of unlucky at times. I think the ball got stuck at his feet a few times when he was trying to do some take ons in the box. And, you know, it just it never really saw a chance come from him. So it's really hard to say that, you know, he really had an impact. But, you know, you can tell that the defense of Toronto was wary. They were they were backing up similarly to what they were doing with Dom most of the time. Um, they were trying to back up, backpedal. And, you know, a lot of times they were, uh, I guess the term is getting stuck in, but they were they were kind of being, you know, putting some niggly fouls in on Barco as we, as we are used to seeing. And for Moreno, uh, you know, there was one really great, through ball that he did that it it, it, it went through three players um and, and it got to dom who was running down the side and then after that we lost all of our runners um, yeah. all of the runs were there and so there really wasn't much for i don't think there was really a whole lot um for him to do except make something happen with barco but with both of those players more or less in the center of the pitch as opposed to further up it's you know it, we really weren't going to see you know the kind of impact that I think Glass wanted them to have because, you know, to put them on, we had to take some other people off. And some of those people just were, uh, you know, some of the people that we put up there. I mean, eventually we put up um, Kubo and we brought Lennon on, but, you know, it just, it, there just wasn't enough going on. So, mm. yeah, the, uh, I think overall, they're, I think overall they did well. And I'm, I'm actually encouraged to see them play uh, a full game with, I'm encouraged to see our strongest lineup, the strongest that we can have without Joseph, obviously. But I'm, I'm I want to see our strongest lineup. Definitely, yeah, because you know when you look at the lineup before the match, uh, the starting eleven looks fine, but that bench looked quite strong, and so we knew, yeah, something had to to kind of happen, uh, something had to kind of give in the second half, and we saw the immediate subs, uh, especially. I think, uh, you know, Glassy's taking advantage of the five sub rule that's uh, come with the pandemic. And so, uh, you know, he's used all of them, I think, uh, you know, recently. And, uh, you know, I think our best chance did come from that Lenin cross to Kubo Torres, who cannot buy a goal. And it's just, uh, it's pretty annoying because, uh, you know, Kubo Torres, like, he's close. He's very close on some of these. He's just, uh, you know, he just wants maybe just to get it a little further into the corner uh, to be able to beat the keeper. But, um, you know, if he can start firing, I think that's where, you know, we need one of our strikers to start uh, putting the ball in the back of the net because that's really largely what's missing. Uh, because defensively, largely look pretty good. Uh, midfield buildup, maybe not the best, but I think defensively we look pretty good in this match with uh, the d kind of double six look with Mo Adams and Eric Rometty. Uh, Hyman kind of being more of the uh, maybe uh, kind of hybrid 8-10. But uh, in terms of that, I mean, I think we were mostly able to keep them at bay. And so that's where, um, you know, Adams and Rometty, that looks pretty good in a sense. Fairly mobile, uh, able to shield the back line for the most part. Uh, it really didn't give... Toronto a lot of clear-cut chances in my eyes so you know it could be some some look going forward obviously that means though you know one of the players that's a little bit more creative maybe has to go 
Um, and that could be Heinemann and Hosetu. And, uh, yeah, we did see Hosetu coming in this match. But, um, yeah, did you see anything from him that was uh, anything of note? Not yet. And I, I don't think I've seen <laughs> much from Hosetu since he's he's come on. I think that, and it's hard because, you know, our team has been so disjointed, um, clashing the philosophies, um, you know, from one regime to the interim regime. And uh, just a lot of new players to acclimate to while you're being new yourself. You know, I think it's going to be hard. Um, it's, it's for me, I'm reserving all my judgment still uh, until we have, again, like you said, like we're missing end product. It's like, well, we can do everything we want to, but if nobody's scoring any goals, it all just looks like it's wasted. But, you know, you put, let's say you put Joseph up top and, you know, some of these passes that, you know, it took five or six or seven touches, um, you know, for, a, you know, for Jean or, a, um, uh, you know, a Gallagher or, you know, whoever, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Castro, whoever is, whoever gets thrown up top, um, you know, but, you know, for Joseph, maybe it's like, you know, two touches and, you know, he's, he's something's off the post or something in the back of the net. So I think it's, I think it's definitely one of those things where, if we had end product, I think all of our players would be look would a lot be, better. <laughs> yeah, and they, they they probably have more confidence too. I mean, sure. it, it hurts your confidence when you're when you're trying to do something and you think you're doing it really well, but you lose. Um, you know, because we we for all intents and purposes we should have at least drawn against Toronto, right. um, in my opinion. If it was going to be nil nil because it was just one of those nights where, like you said, there's no clear cut chances, it happens. Um, you know, but I think that, you know, Atlanta's played well enough to win some games. And, you know, you know, Kubo has put a lot of efforts on goal. Uh, and I don't know if he's going to be one of those guys who just he bags one and then he all of a sudden bags 15. Um, you know, just he seems like a streaky it. player for sure. I mean, yeah. you know, I think throughout his career, he's uh, kind of shown that where he's feast or famine. And, uh, yeah, I think he just needs to see one go in the back of the net. And I think it will be kind of off the races for him. But uh, hopefully he can see one soon, hopefully in the D.C. United match over the weekend. But uh, but definitely, I think, you know, in terms of, um, you know, we are also seeing, I think, you know, Brad Guzan having to make a lot of saves, whether these were kind of like, you know, saves that he can just, you know, it's a regular save. It's not really... Um, you know, a really crazy chance that he did save. He still had to, you know, have his goal peppered uh, throughout, I think, the the past, what, maybe five matches. I mean, he's in his uh, three of the last four matches, I think, anyway. He's made five-plus saves. And so, you know, it's quite a bit. It's still, I think, there's a little bit to be shored up. But largely, it could be where still, you know, are we, like, maybe trying to... Uh, you know, fit a square peg in a round hole when we're trying to play out from the back and we still have to, you know, lump it long because I think there isn't the quality to be able to do it on a consistent basis. Um, it's something that, yeah, I mean, we all want to see this free-flowing attacking football, but should we maybe prioritize the, uh, the results in the business end of the season instead of, um, you know, the aesthetic, beautiful football that, sure, fans want to see, but... You know, they, at the end of the season, want to see results. They want to see us get into the playoffs. Um, so, you know, I think always, at the end of the day, the result is probably what matters the most. And then, if you did it with panache, then great. But, because uh, I think you can see the engagement always soar when there's, uh, you know, the, the team winning. But they don't really care how they got there some of the time. So, it's a bit annoying. I mean, do you feel that way where, you know, should we be playing out of the back sometimes when we might not have the quality? I think that we should definitely mix it up at the very least. Um, playing out of the back invites a lot of a lot of pressure. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to remember the uh, you know the the MLS is back um, tournament, and you know a lot of our goals that we conceded, those the three goals that we conceded, uh, you know, coming from instances where we just are unorganized, and you know after that tournament, we conceded a lot of possession. Um, by our own doing the, you know, and that's the most frustrating thing is, is getting under pressure and conceding goals 
when the other team doesn't have to do anything for it. It's just, you know, pouncing on a ball that was, um, you know, uh, uh, that was played astray. I think that happened, um, that happened in Toronto, actually. Um, you know, at the very, you know, very early on, it was, you know, um, it was a, it was something where uh, I think it was Mo Adams who uh, just mishit a ball and it ends up bouncing back towards our goal. And, you know, Toronto pounce on it. Uh, you know, they don't score anything from it, but it's, it's still one of those situations where you don't want to concede possession and you don't want to keep putting Gazan under pressure. Um, you know, five, you know, five saves is a lot for a keeper. And it's it's not something that you want to take for granted as, oh, yeah, you know, he's got five saves in him. You know, if somebody takes five shots on goal, uh, you know, it's usually one of them goes in at least. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's something to where, you know, it's, you know, you you look at most of the stats that go in across, you know, the MLS and just in most leagues, um, you know, like the once you start getting into the uh, near the, the 10 shot mark. There's got to be at least one goal. Most of the time, there's one goal, or there's an opportunity, um, you know, for cards, penalties, all that stuff, just from rebounds and you know defenses on their heels. So, I would really like for us to find a way to utilize Jean and, and or or Kubo and and, and a hold up play more um, from the long pass, but it just doesn't seem to. It hasn't happened yet, and 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 with the few amount of games that we have left. Uh, I'm not sure it it will happen this season. It's something though that I think that we need to get better at because it's it's clear right now that the way that we want to play isn't going to be successful for us. Um, you know, against a lot of the teams that we're going to play this the rest of this season. Right, because yeah, we, I think frankly put, we need to be able to create chances, and if we cannot get enough runners then the more of the pressure goes on to the forwards uh, and basically right now they're not scoring. And so, you know, you, you need to really incorporate the rest of your team. But if we can't get the rest of the players close enough to be able to, uh, you know, work it around, then, yeah, obviously we're going, going to struggle. We're going to struggle to put the ball in the back of the net. And so, yeah, I think, you know, your point is spot on about m- maybe more hold up play. Uh, maybe more flick ons uh, onto you know runners around uh, whomever is holding it up. I think yeah, largely uh, whether it's Torres or John or if it's Gallagher, yeah, that needs to be able to happen so that you know more of the players can be involved. And yeah, that's something we need to shore up quick. Four games left of the season is not very much. Like I said, business end of the season. They need to figure it out. <laughs> but uh it's all into a close uh, yeah it definitely for us, is it's, it's really crawling to a close it's yes for sure and i think yeah a lot of the fans feel that as well but uh for me personally i still want the team to make the playoffs because those are the stated ambitions and in terms of you know we want to be competing with the likes of like seattle sounders who have made the the playoffs every single year of their existence so sure or at least in mls rather uh, so yeah, we want to be able to, you know, say that we want to, uh, whether we can go far in the playoffs or not, is a whole other thing. But um, yeah, so that pretty much I think, I think wraps it up. Uh, unless you have uh, any final thoughts on the match. No, I, again, I think that there's enough positives, and I think defensively, uh, you know, we've looked really good. Meza and Robinson, um, you know, for over the last few games have looked the part and Robinson looks like he's he's kind of rediscovered that form he had um you know in in previous uh, seasons uh, last season specifically um you know where I, I think he was struggling after the after the covid break and so uh I'm I'm glad to see that that's getting better and I'm glad to see that um you know there's a lot more there's a lot more communication in the back. I think without the fans in the stadium, you can hear the amount of communication that's going on. Mm-hmm. And that is great. And I, I don't know how many people noticed it, but at the beginning when there were no fans present, um, you know, you couldn't hear a pin drop, but you could just, you can hear Steven Glass. Um, you know, now in the the last few matches, I'd say over the last two weeks or so, you've been able to hear the 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 glass still but the players as well uh, are communicating a lot more so i think they're more comfortable with each other and it's showing on the pitch so um i'm, I'm really 
you know, Toronto, like you said, it, they didn't have a lot of clear-cut chances. For a game, not to have that many clear-cut chances, um, there sh- you should have gotten something from it. Um, yeah. That was the disappointing part, but there we definitely held, you know, what was a hot Toronto team in check. Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, they are still undefeated for nine games. Um, I think, interestingly for us as well, we didn't mention this, uh, was that Anton Walks played right back in, in place of Franco Escobar. Uh, so there is, yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't miss too much in the back in a sense. Maybe not as much maybe link-up play uh, on the right side, but when you have Jurgen Dom, who's just able to kind of be the roadrunner and beat everyone in his wake, then yeah, it's uh, you might not need the, uh, the right back very much to either overlap or, uh, you know, cut in with, uh, you know, Dom being wide, whichever, but... Uh, either way, we'll wrap that baby up and get into the news, which, yeah, looking at the MLS standings, we have unfortunately fallen to 11th. Uh, Chicago and Nashville have a game in hand on us, or at least a couple game in hands for Nashville in their regard. But, uh, yeah, not not too far off, but it is still, I think, uh, yeah, not insurmountable, but we got to do our part. And uh, but we gotta wish that they pretty much don't do their part. Um, yeah, do you think that in terms of these MLS standings and the way it's you know it's looking right now, can we make the playoffs? I think it's going to take a lot, um, and I say that because we need wins, we don't need draws, and so yeah. far we're we're not scraping out a lot of wins. Um, and that's the concerning thing. We're not we're not scraping out wins from people who are beneath us in the standings. Uh, we still haven't beaten Inter um, Inter Miami, um, you know, for one. And uh, you know there there are a lot of there are a lot of things I think that would have to go right for us to make playoffs. I'm still hopeful as well, but I think that it. It, somebody's going to have to catch fire, you know, Kubo's going to start bagging, you know, like uh, braces, Gallagher is going to have to, you know, start, um, you know, popping in more shots from, from the top of the box, you know, Barco's going to, you know, you know, Barco, all this stuff would have to happen for us to make playoffs. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying it can't, and I'm not saying that we won't, but it's, it's looking like it's kind of like a far off prospect right now. Yeah. Because, yeah, we, ha- we would have to synergize a few aspects of our game to really kind of make that push. And so far, currently, we have not seen that. So that's a very fantastic mm-hmm. point. Uh, now, you know, our next four matches are in the last four matches of the regular season. Of course, our DC United, Orlando City, FC Cincy, and then Columbus Crew on decision day. And so we'll hope, of course, that Nagby cannot take part or just maybe doesn't take part. Uh, maybe we do to rest uh, with that crew match. But uh, yeah, FC Cincy, DC definitely look like the most winnable. Obviously, Orlando are flying high. So, you know, these are uh, some of them are winnable, but, you know, we have to put it together. And that's that's been a thing. But um, moving on to the uh, Supporter Shield and an update on that. The Supporter Shield Foundation put out a tweet saying essentially that the 2020 Supporter Shield will not be given. And uh, that obviously had some people incensed, uh, most notably probably uh, Toronto that are leading the Supporter Shield. Uh, But yeah, a lot of the maybe, I think, chatter, I think, is centered around some of the supporters groups not being involved in the decision. Uh, but they are, uh, as of now, they are reassessing and speaking with the supporters groups. But thoughts on this development and if the shield will be scrapped completely, what do you think? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Like there has to be, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to do away with it, you know, then I would rather it be done away with and I'm not saying I want done with. I'm saying if you're going to do away with it, I wouldn't do away with it in a in a in a year like this, mm. where it's really tough for a lot of these teams to compete, stay healthy, and for teams like Toronto um, get a run of good form to show how good they are and and get them in a place where they can, you know, have something, have something for all the achievements. Otherwise, why not just play a tournament? 
you know, if you're not going to have the supporter shield, why not just play a tournament at the very, like, just have the whole season be a tournament, you know, and call it and still crown an MLS champion. Um, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, it, it if you're going to use the MLS's back tournament to kind of seed in a, a, a bigger tournament, um, then that would have made more sense than having that tournament going to the regular season. And you're going to have playoffs with expanded rosters, but you're going to do away with this. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, reassessing is, is one thing, but it's, uh, you know, maybe it's a PR spin or whatever, but it uh, to me, it just, I think that you don't take away something like that. That's That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the reasons that I didn't mention was that uh, because supporters aren't being aren't able to be in the stadium to uh, at least largely anyway, because there are some obviously games that have had supporters in the stands, but uh, and I kind of almost unfairly in a way some some have uh, extra support and some don't, uh, so there maybe is an argument for them in that regard, but um, you know there is still the unbalanced schedule that it always has been. So that kind of really goes out the window slightly as well when, you know, every other year it's unbalanced. But uh, I think interestingly, I think for me, I think if they do decide to do away with it this year, maybe MLS comes up with their own little thing to reward, uh, you know, the best in, I guess, the regular season. Or uh, I propose maybe, if they're listening, uh, for an Eastern Conference and Western Conference winner, kind of like a pennant in baseball. Uh, where, because, yeah, you know, most of the teams are playing teams in their division or conference, and so why not give it to, you know, the best of each of those and give, you know, kind of the reward that way? Uh, I think that would be, I think, more poignant, at least, uh, a little bit more Makes fair. Sense. I mean, that's what, that's what all, you, that's what all, that's what all American sports does, you know, right. whether it's NBA, MLB, um, you know, even the NFL, you know, they, they get rewarded for winning their conference mm-hmm. and then they get, you know, to move on and, and do stuff in the playoffs. So it, again, does just doesn't make sense to me, but it, it, you know, it is what it is sometimes. Definitely. Uh, and so, uh, other things that, uh, maybe might not make a whole lot of sense, but, and also maybe that we probably really don't want to revisit is the 2020 CONCACAF Champions League. Uh, it reportedly could be set to resume during the third week of December. Obviously, uh, Atlanta United are down 3-0 against Club America and are coming home to the Benz and having to face that uh, after, I don't know, however long of a break as well. <laughs> I don't know if any fans will be there, to be honest. Um, there, there could be a few, but uh, that's that's just a... Yeah, it's a, I think fate might be sealed there, especially if Joseph does not start. Uh, what, what do you think of those prospects? Yeah, I don't, I don't like it either. I mean, it, <laughs> and I until you mentioned it, I had almost completely forgotten that we were down by that much. Um, so it was, you know, one of those things where it's just like, hey, you know, it was, when it starts back up, we'll see what happens, you know. But yeah, if they're if if we with the team that we currently have and the way we're playing currently, I don't see us making up a, uh, that kind of a gap. So, um, you know, it. We stranger things have happened, but it's yeah. I don't like the prospects very much. Right. I mean, if Joseph can magically come back, but then still it'd be a one-off. We don't have any matches to build that up either. If it just yeah, we'd be coming in cold and risk getting injured again, and right. it's yeah. Nope. Yeah. Uh, the the prospects <laughs> of that are uh, are grim, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So anyway, let's move on to. MLS announcing steps to combat racism and increase black representation. I think this is uh, good to see that they're taking these steps. They unveiled a series of initiatives on Monday aimed at combating uh, combating racism, advocating for social justice, and increasing black representation in the sports. Uh, They will be... uh, Kind of uh, implementing new programs uh, includes the formation of a diversity committee uh, consisting of members of the MLS Board of Governors, Don Garber, uh, representatives of the Black Players for Change, and other members of the soccer community. And uh, it's a result of several months of discussions. But uh, I think, you know, that's good to see, but it also is you want to see uh, all of this 
Uh, they want to. I want to see them put their actions where their mouth is, because obviously this is you know good to say and all that, but you know we want to see uh, them actually hire some uh, you know black head coaches, hire some black uh, you know front office members, uh, you know stuff like that. Where I think it really will start to uh, change the league, and then of course uh, adding and building on that, you will see more people of color. Uh, because I think historically, yeah, you have seen, uh, you know, kind of initiatives like this or not even, not even just initiatives, but, um, you know, black players kind of lead the charge. So kind of like, you know, Jackie Robinson, you know, players like that, that have, uh, you know, at least opened the, uh, the kind of floodgates to, uh, you know, more things happening for people of color. But, uh, yeah, well, what's your, what's your take on this? I, I, I like it. At the same time, I'm with you. I, I like to see it. I always like to see it go a step further. Um, you know, rather than you know, rather than just you know something to satisfy a uh, you know a quote. Like NFL has like the Rooney Rule, for instance. Yeah. You know, where you have to at least interview um, you know a, a you know a minority candidate for a head coaching position. Uh, you know, and and that, all that stuff. It kind of gets. It kind of gets played up as something that is really, you know, really substantial when, you know, ultimately you do see a lot of, you know, retreads come through and you have, um, you know, a lot of there's there's a lot of times there's a scouting problem when it and and for me, I think it has to go a little bit further than that. I think that the actions that they say publicly and loudest, you know, are always great, but you got to, you know, kind of like you said, put your put a lot more thought, put a lot more actions into it. And sort of identify where the where the where the initial point starts, and I think a lot of it is you know is the recruiting. It is the um, you know similar to how uh, you know how you know players, soccer players, and you know in America at the very least, you know are you know how you know there's a lot of good talent out there that's never seen um, because they don't have the access, they don't have the uh, they don't have resources the, you know, the, yeah the resources. To... And there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of good you know coaches out there that are ones that we haven't seen and i think that it's i think it's very much one of those things where you know like yes having somebody in for an interview is always great having that that one guy you know like the like you know, like said the nfl's rumor was but i think that you you don't start seeing the change until there's actually a change to the way things are structured and that starts with the the scouting um, and the your the internal departments that are actually you know, sort of identifying you know coaching talent and potential stuff, um, you know nurturing uh, nurturing people who could have that acumen into being you know assistants and you know eventually head coaches or people in the front office, um, you know that sort of stuff. I think needs to happen more so than again. I I love it when people put these initiatives forward. Um, you know, uh, it is kind of in vogue now, which, you know, it, it should always kind of be like this, but, um, you know, again, can't, can't complain. Just hope that it is that hope that it's a, a legitimate step forward. And that's what I hope. Right. Legitimate and long-term, uh, where they won't just scrap it in a, a year or two because, yeah. you know, it's not as in vogue as you just said, because yeah, definitely. Of course, this comes on the heels of. Uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, things like that, uh, social movements uh, that have, I think, taken hold, I think rightly so. Uh, obviously, there are some people, there's some people who are like, oh, uh, well, don't we already have a lot of diversity in the sport right now anyway? A lot of uh, players from South America or from other places. But that's the thing. I mean, if you look across the board on coaches, on front office hires, um, you know, you don't see enough minorities in general in you know most of those areas and so i think a lot more still needs to be done um yeah you see still see far more as just you know kind of the the white patriarchy that um you know of course is super prevalent and um you know i think we'll step off of the the uh, soapbox now it won't be as serious for the rest of the episode but still i think it's definite uh i think things that we need to talk about and uh so but uh anyway moving on and uh arthur blank uh yeah his foundation has announced a 20 million grant for the arthur m blank center for stuttering education and research at the university of texas and uh 
Yeah, I think uh, you know he's been kind of donating to so many things recently. It's uh, yeah. it's just madness, really. But um, really, I think uh, in terms of I think owners in sports, he's got to be the best in terms of America for me. I mean, it's just it's undisputed almost at this point, just because uh, you know not only of uh, the types of initiatives. Just, I think, uh, you know, in terms of how good of a person he seems to be as well. It's, um, you know, in terms of as far as billionaires go, um, you, I think we'll find fewer better than he. So, uh, anyway, let's move on from that uh, and to an Atlanta United concept kit, which, I mean, yeah, there is, uh, it's kind of getting into that kind of... Uh, uh, time of the year that there will be a new kit being unveiled. Uh, at least rumors uh, will be starting to transpire around this time. Sometime probably next February there will be a new one uh, announced for the primary kit. But uh, this one, I think, uh, in terms of a concept kit, very interesting. Kind of similar based on uh, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Uh, kind of pretty much off of the back of the uh, saying that Atlanta was the cradle of the civil rights movement uh, and with Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, part of his initials appear in the jock tag. What do you think of uh, you know this kit and if it was real? I like it. I mean, it's, it's, it's different and I think it still incorporates enough of Atlanta United's history while also reaching for, um, you know, you know a more i guess more diverse history as well so you know i like it i, I you know having there's you get used to it at this point just the to, to changes of kits and stuff but you know for, for this specific one um you know I, I actually do i think it i think it would I think it would take a little bit more time to grow on me completely but you know initially <laughs> i do like the concept of it yeah because obviously i mean uh mls is a little bit more uh i think maybe conservative in their designs nowadays. Definitely not uh, in the 90s where they were as wild as you could be. But, um, yeah, this one maybe kind of harkens back to a little bit of that. Uh, I think, obviously, if they ever went with this type of design, uh, they would also probably have to pay, uh, I think, um, you know, what's the term? Um, just for the idea of this, they would have to pay a pretty penny, penny I'm sure. So... Very unlikely, of course. And then, of course, also the unlikely part of it is because uh, the uh, the sleeves and the three stripes on top is for the 25th anniversary of MLS. So that's also unlikely. But I think the design of it off of the building of uh, the the Civil and Human Rights Building, I think that's uh, I think really, really um, you know not only poignant, but I think uh, has good history, has good um, you know, hearkening to a lot of good things that are part of Atlanta. So uh, it would be cool if they tried to adopt some of that into the new kit. Um, of course, though, the new kit probably is already done. There's, uh, I think, usually a year in advance is uh, what I know of any new design. Uh, kind of has to make through the rounds. And so it's a while. And so, uh, yeah. Whatever we we, uh, we will hear about in the coming months, it will already be a finished product. So uh, let's move on into, uh, yeah, our Academy and Charlotte FC, the new expansion side uh, in 2022. Uh, they will be playing together uh, or playing against each other rather on August, or October 31st on that Saturday. Uh, and MLSsoccer.com already calls it the I-85 Clash. But uh, it will be, I think, yeah, uh, fun to see at least uh, maybe the what they're wanting. Uh, of course, uh, MLS is really wanting uh, kind of new rivalries always to brew up out of nowhere. But uh, our U-17 and U-15 Academy teams will take on each other at Bank of America Stadium over there. Um, yeah, it'll be it'll be fun to see in that sense. But uh, the in terms of like Charlotte, uh, the whole CLTFC fans have already gotten my mentions and are you know making this hyped up to be maybe bigger than it already is. When it seems very one sided, like Charlotte kind of has this hatred toward uh, towards us, and really for us, we're like, who are you? <laughs> 
So it's really, uh, it's really not even. <laughs> really, for most of us, it's really not even a big deal. But um, I thought, you know, it, it's uh, it's good to know that that's happening and that could be brewing at least from the academy side. Um, they of course also have the unfortunate, you know, CLT moniker as well that uh, harkens some other things that <laughs> we won't get into too much. But uh, <laughs> still, just yeah. What are they thinking? What are they? Come on. There's a complete lack of awareness in marketing there. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll move on swiftly from that and get to the mailbag. And you guys send in these questions through IG story. Please continue to do so. And we might answer your question in the future. So first question comes from Sheaves77. Do you see a better 2021 for Atlanta with the current roster? Yes, I do. I think that with the roster that we have, because again, it, it, our current roster includes Joseph to me. And so just by him coming back, I think that we'll have a better, I think we'll have a better time. I think that, um, you know, another, like a whole season, this is, these are the kind of seasons that kind of make a team um, stick. And I think that going through the adversity that we have so far this season, um you know even if it's been self self-inflicted at times uh will definitely help us have a better year next year yeah no definitely self-inflicted uh yeah selling a dp uh you know essentially kind of mutually parting ways with fire slash firing a coach um yeah you know injury that's yeah it, it is obviously i mean injury maybe is the the thing that isn't self-inflicted but Definitely. I think uh, once you inject Joseph into this lineup, um, you have some solid pieces. And so I think, you know, you just need to add for me a number six that can, I think, do the job that uh, connects the lines. You know, essentially what Darlington Nagby did. Um, <laughs> because you need composure to get out of those tight spaces. And right now we can't do that. And so that's the very large hole that we have in the middle of our pitch right now. Um, so next question comes from Chambre Poppy. What a name, what a name. Uh, the question is, what level of realistic expectations should we have for the team next season? I think playoffs. I mean, if, if we, so if we miss out on playoffs, then playoffs should be the goal next year. Um, and I would, I would believe that if we make the playoffs, we'd want to win. Um, and, and assuming that all of the other tournaments are intact, um, you know, then you'd like to see some silverware next year as well. Us get back to winning ways, um, you know, because we've had a number of games this season where we we could just, if we just nicked another goal, we would have won, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, or at least drawn. And so, you know, when you get our score back, you have to assume that, you know, you know, if, if Joseph's got, you know, another 15 to 30 uh, goals in his locker, then, you know, at, you know, ideally a lot of these draws or, you know, losses will turn into, you know, draws and wins. And I think that with that as a, as a minimum, that playoffs has to be the first expectation. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, um, Obviously, the striker is one of the most important. I would say striker, goalkeeper, uh, you're just basically your spine is, you know, those are the most important positions on the pitch. Uh, but Joseph, by virtue of adding uh, that many goals, can change game states that it'll be, I think, flipped on its head. I mean, just that many goals makes games either, uh, you know, 2 1, 3 1, blowouts. You know, yeah. it'll, it'll be just completely, uh, completely changed on its head. But obviously, there are still other parts of our of our team that still need some shoring up as well. But uh, next question comes from Diego Villan. Do you think the coach is the issue? I assume they're talking about Stephen Glass. I would say the lack of a consistent coach throughout the year is an issue. But I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, this is... Like you said, this has been the first game where we've had two DPs on the field at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also the first game that we've had two people who are eligible to be DPs, um, you know, actually be healthy at the same time in a very long time. So I, I think that it is, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily that it's Glass's fault for where we are. 
uh, as much as it is just, again, you know, a lot of self-inflicted stuff that's happened um, since the start of the season um, after Joseph's injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you've already mentioned it, um, you know, uh, selling PT and, uh, you know, letting uh, FDB have his walking papers. All of that stuff, I think, has been, um, you know, more so to blame than our current interim coach. Right. Because, yeah, he can only work with what's in front of him. And basically, you know, it's uh, in this league, uh, teams are very top heavy in that sense because you can only spend that kind of top dollar on three players. And uh, when you don't have any, that will really change things. No matter who you are uh, in any league, I mean, most of the time when you take, the, you know, pretty much their three of the best players off of uh, their roster, they will struggle. I mean, most of the time, maybe bar, maybe Man City who have like two 11s, but even then, you can see that they struggle when they don't have important pieces, um, yeah. you know, in their defense or, you know, up front. And so, you know, I think that's a huge part of this. Uh, the coach can, I think, only eke a percentage better than, I think, uh, you know, what uh, the kind of average one can. And I think you, you also, we also need to take uh, into account that Stephen Glass is an interim head coach and so he's not a permanent hire and we shouldn't really treat him as such like he's learning on the job as well so uh next question comes from uh, Diego Villan uh what do you think is is wrong on in this team and uh, what should we do to solve it I think we kind of mentioned it earlier but um yeah we can maybe briefly speak on like what what we think it might be chance creation I mean, we, yeah. our I, our defense was a major issue for a little bit, but we have we are now more than just treading water. I think we're doing decently on defense uh, in the last few games, but the uh, the chance creation has been poor throughout the entire season, second half of the season, I should say. So Definitely. that is a major problem. I think that we need to fix. Right, and uh, yeah, not only chance creation. I think uh, you know, kind of getting to that point. The, the connectivity between the lines is, I think, you know, maybe even a larger issue because we don't have, uh, you know, kind of the ways to get it to the players that can create chances. So if they're left on, on an island, well, yeah, you're going to see pretty much what we're seeing. Just anemic, anemic, um, you know, kind of attack. But um all right so next question comes from ethan uh bocon 776 with a kind of two-parter question if you were darren eels and barco leaves who would you sign he says i would sign either gabriel verone pedro de la vega or ivan tony and in terms of those guys that he's mentioned uh, gabriel verone is an 18 year old brazilian uh plays for palmeras right winger valued at 27 and a half million on transfer markets uh pedro de la vega is a 19 year old argentine playing for lanus right winger as well uh 9.9 million market value per transfer markets and uh ivan tony is an english player uh who plays as a striker for championship side brentford and so you know uh and and okay his uh market value is 4.95 million so you know obviously those are three wildly different uh kind of valued players for sure but uh who would you sign uh for yeah if barco leaves it doesn't have to be any of those players but yeah i you know i i don't think that you know, I don't think I have a great answer for that just because there's so many players and there's and it really depends on the next coach's philosophy, um, you know, because Barco is a very specific type of player, right? You know, he's, he's going to hold on to the ball for a good bit of time and he's going to try to, at the very least, drive out of defense. Now, if you're trying, if the next coach comes in and wants to be a a some of the parts, and you attack with your with your um, with your fullbacks and your wingers, um, you know, then the need for that that uh, that player in the middle who can hold on to the ball, um, you know, and and can dribble and, and sort of take on players, kind of goes out. And so I honestly would reserve that until our next coach comes in because. Again, you don't want to have a situation where you know. Um, look at look at uh, look at Petey Martinez. He, he didn't really fit with uh, the Boer system, 
Um, you know, and, you know, for long periods of time, people question whether or not he was good enough. But if the system doesn't suit the player and this player doesn't suit the system, then, you know, it, you can sign all the talent you want to. But it's I think whatever system we decide to implement, you know, it, it's 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 going to be something that is going to be the first question before we talk about the the players. You know, we could, you know, we could pull in, you know, somebody like, um, you know, and get name off the top of my head, um, you know, like a uh, Ozo from overseas because he can actually, you know, you know, create a decent bit of chances, um, you know, in, in this league at the, you know, at the very least. Um, but, you know, guy, again, you, you want, you need to have a system because he's very much like the, the pity type um, where, you know, you need some runners and stuff like that. So, I, again, I think that it's going to, the, who, who we sign and who I would like to see sign really depends on the next coaching philosophy that we have. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, if Ozil was brought in, I mean, he's a little bit different uh, than PT in slight ways in terms of more of a creator, maybe less of a shooter, uh, but both are luxury players for sure. And um, yeah, it, I, in, if we had to choose, you know, the players that you mentioned in terms of Verone, De La Vega, uh, Ivan Tony, I would think in terms of, you know, maybe need, uh, it's it's difficult because obviously uh, some of these players kind of are, we already have players in those positions. You know, they're yeah, strikers, too. they're right wingers. Uh, it might displace maybe uh, a Jurgen Dom or some of the other incumbents. They might be better players, sure, but, uh, you know, you might not want to spend as many resources in one department when you're kind of cash strapped uh, because of, you know, MLS salary structures. So I think for me, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of promise with Gabriel Verone, but you, if you want to pay $28 million, essentially, um, that would be wildly the record fee. Uh, so Pedro de la Vega might be more of the, uh, the type of player that we want Maybe hopefully he can play more on the the left wing, um, but I think for me, uh, Tiago Almeida I think also would be a really decent shout in terms of uh, an attacking midfielder that might kind of fit that uh, kind of mold. 19 year old. Uh, if we want to go with a little bit more established, maybe Christian Pavone. What a talent he is! If we could pry him away from LA Galaxy, that would be pretty tasty because he's in his prime, and if he could play for Atlanta United, maybe that could help him uh, make his move to Europe, because, you know, maybe he wins some trophies with us. He ain't doing that with LA Galaxy, that's for sure. But uh, next question comes from The Brown Stick. Any predictions about our next coach? I am thinking. I am I'm going to... I'm going to go the unconventional route, but it is really in vogue now with players coming back all the time. I would say something that would revitalize this club is having somebody like Parkhurst be the next coach. If he so had the credentials to do so and actually wanted to do it, I think that would be something to where that would, you know, again, it, it would revitalize it, um, you know, because that's somebody from the from the Tata days. Um, and from our championship days, which has only been a couple of years, but I mean, you know, I think that that would be something that would re revitalize the club and I think would give us uh, something to really cheer about. And I think that would be, um, you know, some that sort of feeling would be sort of the next move. But, I, you know, I do have a feeling that it's going to be, um, I don't want to say an unknown. And, you know, I don't also want to say that it's going to be like some kind of waiting game. Um, for when the next season starts, but you know, there's um, uh, I'll say there's there's a, there's another couple of, of of names that I'd rather not say just because of the the teams that they're they've been affiliated with in the past. Um, just just hurts me to say it. So, um, but uh, <laughs> um, and you may know what I'm talking about, but you know, I think that there's. <laughs> No, 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 not a, not, not our side. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's more so, um, you know, rivals. I think of like young coaches that are looking to sort of prove themselves, um, you know, in a, in a place where there is some talent on display, um, you know, and so I, I think that uh, there's, there's a couple that 
um, might, you know, hesitate, but then jump when they when they figure out that, you know, maybe this is a great platform to kind of get to the next thing. You know, both of our previous coaches are now coaching our national team. So, um, you know, have that as you will. So, you know, it, yeah, no, it definitely is uh, very interesting in regards to our former coaches, for sure. Uh, Frank DeBoer, namely, has definitely uh, failed forward and upwards more so. But, uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, I think Gabriel Heinze is my number one choice. Uh, he was recently linked with Palmeiras, but uh, if we could somehow entice him, he is a Bielsaite. Uh he is kind of having that attacking style that we want. I think he would bring, I think, what we want in a, in a head coach, ideally. Uh, Miguel Herrera at Club America also would be another great shout. Uh, if he maybe just doesn't work out at Club America, that could be something that uh, could work out for us. Maybe he switches over to the other side for our CCL match against them and helps us reverse that scoreline, that would be quite an interesting sight indeed. But, uh, yeah, that pretty much does it for the mailbag and gets us to the question of the day. And the question of the day is, what do you think of the Supporter Shield situation? Do you want it to go away? Would you like the Supporter Shield to continue? Let us know in the comments below. But that does it for us today. For Chris, who, by the way, is our Twitter man, so give him all the love on the live Twitter days when uh, there is a match. Please show him all the love in the tweets. Liking, retweeting, all of that jazz. But, uh, yes, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. I'm AJ, and we will see you in the next video.